welcome. This is information for Unit 3, and previously I looked at an example involving two independent samples, and we were looking for differences between two groups and their means. We had one group of couples that had received premarital education, another group of couples that did not receive that education, and we were looking for differences between those two groups and their mean levels of commitment or satisfaction. And now I'd like to look at a paired samples example. We have a paired samples data set. And any time you have paired samples, what that means is that every case has two scores or two observations or two assessments. A very common type of paired samples data set would be a situation where you assess a group of people on two occasions. So maybe you have people come in and at time one, you assess their level of happiness and then maybe you give them some kind of happiness intervention. Maybe you tell them jokes for a while or for a few days or something like that. And then afterwards, you assess their happiness again at time two to see if there was a change in their happiness over time. And the key thing we're looking for here is a difference in scores. How much do scores go up or down over time? Is there a change in scores from time one to time two? Uh, here we have a slightly different type of paired samples data set in that we have couples. These are all heterosexual married couples, and so every couple has one husband and one wife, and we can do an analysis where we look for differences between husbands and wives. Is there a gender difference? Uh, specifically, in this example, we're going to look at something called demand withdraw communication. And that's a pattern of communication that goes something like this. You start off, you have one partner that has some kind of complaint or criticism or something that person wants to change in the relationship. And so that person voices that concern or that complaint. And the other partner hearing that concern feels like, well, this feels like a criticism. It feels like kind of unpleasant. I don't really like this. It feels a bit noxious. I don't, I want to kind of escape from this. I want to get away. So I'll step back. I'll withdraw just a bit because I don't really like this. Now, the first partner that raised the criticism to begin with then thinks, well, this isn't what I wanted at all. In fact, that's the exact opposite. I was trying to make things better in the relationship. I was trying to raise issues that we need to address and deal with to bring us closer together. You are moving away. That's the exact opposite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to express my criticism or my complaint just a little bit louder with a little bit stronger terms. And you might guess where this is going, because the more the first partner increases the criticism and the complaint, the more the second partner backs off and withdraws and becomes silent or distant or tries to avoid the discussion. And you get into this demand withdraw cycle of communication, where one partner is demanding or criticizing, raising complaints or concerns, and the other partner is backing off, withdrawing, becoming silent, trying to avoid the discussion. So we can ask a question with this. Is there a gender difference in the roles people take on when they engage in demand withdrawal communications? It's actually a very common type of communication. It's uh, when couples experience relationship distress. Uh, it's very common to use a lot of demand withdrawal communication. But just about all couples use this maybe a little bit to some degree. Uh, and the question is, is there a gender difference in terms of what roles people take on? Uh, now, if we go with the stereotypes, I suppose the stereotype would probably be that women might be more likely to be the, the ones that are doing the criticizing or the complaining or the nagging, uh, raising the issues. And maybe stereotypically, we might think that men are going to be the ones who are going to be withdrawing, uh, who want to avoid the discussion, who don't want to get involved in conflict and talking about feelings. And, and so they might be more likely to withdraw and become silent and distant. So the question is, is that true? Do we find any evidence for that type of stereotype? So we can look at that with this data set. This is a data set I collected actually several years ago uh, with uh, couples that completed questionnaires on the inter internet. And uh, we had 394 married couples. We had both partners of every couple completed this questionnaire. And the questionnaire looked like this. Uh, they completed something called a Communication Patterns Questionnaire developed by Andy Christensen at UCLA many years ago. A uh, questionnaire used to measure different types of communication, including the demand withdrawal pattern of communication. And there's two scales we're going to look at here. Uh, one is we'll call, I'll just shorthand, I'll call it wife withdrawal, but it's shorthand for husband demand, wife withdrawal. And the other is called husband withdrawal, and that's shorthand for um, wife demand, husband withdrawal. And every partner of every couple uh, completed three questions about the extent of wife withdrawal or husband demand wife withdrawal. And every person uh, completed three questions about husband withdrawal. 
uh, a sample question is down at the bottom here. So for example, this would be assessing wife demanding and husband withdrawal. So that would be assessing this husband withdrawal scale here. Woman nags and demands while man withdraws, becomes silent or refuses to discuss the matter further. So the husband completes that and the wife completes it. So they, we got two assessments of that question. And there's actually a total of three questions. There's one there. There's two other questions. So all together, there's six items total. Three were completed by the wife. And the same three, again, were completed by the husband. Um, to get a total of six items, uh, the total score uh, looks like it's reasonably reliable. Our alpha, our reliability here is 0.78. So that would give us adequate reliability. And then we also have six items measuring wife withdrawal. Um, three completed by the wife, three completed by the husband. Again, we have adequate reliability, 0.73. So the question is, if we calculate a difference, is there a difference between the average level of wife withdrawal and husband withdrawal? Is there a difference between those two? Do we find that uh, there's a gender difference in the roles people take on, at least what they report taking on in their relationships? Here are the results of this analysis. This is an SPSS output for paired samples t-test t -test and uh, looking for differences uh, between the pairs of scores. So let's see what we have here. So we have, here's the mean for wife withdrawal, that's 3.57. The mean for husband withdrawal is 4.53. There's about, about, with rounding here, about one unit of difference between those two scores. Um, now the question is, if there's a one unit difference, how big of a difference is that? And another question is, if there's a one unit difference, is that significant? Can we reject the null hypothesis that the difference is zero? Um, and that's what we will look at shortly. Now recall that with a paired samples uh, data set, we have three scores for every case. So in this case, a case is a couple, and every couple has three scores. We have the score for the wife, the score for the husband, and the difference score, wife score minus husband score. So we have three means. So again, we have, uh, we have paired samples. We have the mean for the wives, the mean for the husbands, and the mean difference score, the mean of all their difference scores. And that's what we have here. We have the mean for the wives right here, 3.57, mean for the husbands, 4.53, and the mean difference score is down here. It's actually negative 0.96 almost a unit of difference, not quite one full unit of difference between wives and husbands. Um, note that down at the bottom, it says pair differences right there. When it says pair differences, that means that everything under that heading is giving you information about the difference scores. So the top table where it's uh, up here, that table at the top here, that's giving you information separately about wives scores and husbands. Down at the bottom where it says pair differences, that's giving you all the information about the difference scores. And so we have the means, we have the mean for the wives, the mean for the husbands, and the mean uh, for the difference scores. Then we also have standard deviations. Here we have the standard deviation for the wives, 1.62, standard deviation for the husbands, 1.79, and the standard deviation of the difference scores down here under that lower table where it says pair of differences, that's the standard deviation of the difference scores. Um, now, looking at those standard deviations, if we look for wives and husbands here, I'm going to go back up to this slide without, whoop, right there. Let's look at the standard deviation of the difference score, or the standard deviations for wives and husbands up there, 1.62, 1.79. Just to get a general ballpark estimate of how big of an effect we have here, I note that those standard deviations are a little bit less than two, not quite two. I just kind of just rounding things to get a ballpark here. So something a little bit less than two, where our difference between our two groups is about one unit of difference. And so if I've got about one unit of difference when the standard deviations are not quite two, uh, just for a ballpark estimate here, we see we've got about, about one half, maybe a little bit more than one half of a standard deviation of difference uh, between wives and husbands. So we know that our D statistic is going to be something in the general ballpark of a little bit larger than 0.5, a little bit larger than half a standard deviation of difference between these two groups. Just estimate looking at the, the mean standard deviations we have there. Um, also, I want to call attention to a few things that make this output different than when we looked at two independent samples. Uh, one thing that when we had two independent samples, we had that Levine's test for equality of variances. That's not here. And, and also with Levine's test for equality of variances, there were two rows where you had the t-test. You had one row that was for if you assumed equal variances and a second row for if you didn't assume that. And here we just have one row. We don't have those two rows.
And the reason for that is that we don't need to worry about that assumption of equality of variances when I'm doing a paired samples t-test. Because there's only one group, only one standard deviation. I have this one standard deviation over different scores. And so there's no need to have an assumption about equality of variances or equality of standard deviations between two different groups because I don't have two groups. I just have one group. I don't have two standard deviations. I just have one standard deviation, just the standard deviation of the different scores. So we don't need to worry about two different standard deviations being equal to each other. Uh, so there's no Levine's test for equality of variances and no alternate lines for whether or not we do or don't have equality of variances. Uh, another thing to note is that we have this thing in the middle where it says paired sample correlations. And we did not have that when we looked at two independent samples. Uh, and that's because this is that question that we can address when we have paired samples and it's not feasible to address this type of questions if you have two independent groups. In this situation with paired samples, every case has two scores. And if every case has two scores, you can say, well, are these two scores correlated with each other? How you scored on the first score is there a relationship between your first score and your second score. In this example, those two scores are scores from wives and husbands. So we can say, is there a correlation between wives and husbands? That is, if you have a husband who reports or is re described as having a very high level of withdrawal, is the wife also going to have a high level of withdrawal? If you have a husband who has very low withdrawal, is he likely to be paired with a wife with low withdrawal? Um, and that you could have that type of correlation. Is there a rank order correlation so that the highest withdrawing husbands are paired with the highest withdrawing wives? And that type of correlation could exist if there is a big gender difference or if there isn't a gender difference. This doesn't tell you are husbands on average higher or lower than wives. It's a matter of if you have a husband whose rank order, he's like the highest withdrawing husband, is he likely to be paired with a wife who's the highest ranked wife withdrawer? Uh, is there a match between husbands and wives like that? Or is it all just scrambled so there's no relationship? So we're looking at the paired samples correlation. And that paired sample correlation is 0.18. It's the correlation between wives and husbands, which is uh, a small correlation. Now, if we look at our p-value over here, the significance, uh, it's something less than 0.001. Uh, the output rounds to 0.000, although, of course, we cannot have a p-value of exactly zero. It's been rounded. So it's something less than 0.001. So it is significant. We can reject the null hypothesis and say that the correlation is, is something different from zero, uh, although it looks like a fairly small correlation, a positive correlation, saying there is some small degree of pairing uh, that if we have a high withdrawing husband, he's somewhat likely to have, a, uh, the wife is likely to be somewhat similar, uh, a little bit of a, a relationship there. So that is what our output looks like. Uh, let's go through and uh, look at the types of questions uh, that I might ask and the things I might want you to be able to do with this type of output. Uh, first of all, I might ask this question here simply, what is the average difference score? That is, we have uh, the average of the wives, we have the average for the husbands, and then for every couple, we can take wife score minus husband score to get that couple's difference score. And then we can take the average of all the different scores for all the couples in our sample. And the thing to keep in mind is that the average of the different scores is mathematically identical to what you'd get if you take the mean for wives minus the mean for husbands. So the difference between our two means is mathematically identical to the average of everybody's difference score. And of course, that's what's printed down here where it says mean we can take that mean uh, negative 0.96, and that's a mean for the paired differences in our differences section down there. So that mean is wife score, my wife mean minus husband mean. It's a difference between 3.57 minus 4.53. It is also the average of all the couple's different scores. If you add up everyone's different scores and divide by sample size to get the average difference score, that's negative 0.96. What else? I could ask this question. For wives, what is the difference, or what is the distance that wives scores typically deviated from the wives group mean? And that, of course, is asking for a standard deviation. If I ask how far do scores typically deviate from the mean, well, that's just what a standard deviation tells you. And so I'm simply asking for the standard deviation for wives, which was 1.62. Or I could ask this other question here. I could say, what is the typical distance of people's different scores deviated from the group mean different score? 
So now I'm still asking about a standard deviation, but now I'm asking about the standard deviation, not for the, the wife scores or the husband scores, but the standard deviation of the different scores. And that's this standard deviation down here at the bottom for the pair of different scores, 2.19, the standard deviation of the different scores. Uh, what else I could say? If this study were repeated over and over, how much would you typically expect the mean for wives to deviate from the true population parameter for the mean? So now that's asking for a standard error of the mean. How far the mean typically deviates from the true population parameter, that's the standard error of the mean. And so if I ask that, the answer to that is 0.08. There's standard error of the mean right down here, 0.08. That tells you how far the wives mean will typically deviate from the true population parameter if you do this study over and over again. Or what I might do is maybe I might just scribble that out and say, you tell me what the standard error of the mean is. And you can do that. I have the equation at the top here. Uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. It's the exact same equation we looked at in the previous section where we talked about two independent samples. We can do the same thing here, no difference. Uh, a standard error of a mean, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So I plug that in, our standard deviation is 1.62. Our sample size is 394. And so 1.62 divided by the square root of 394, I get 0.08, which indeed is what we have down here for the standard error of the mean. Or we could do the same thing for the husbands. We could calculate the husband's standard error. Uh, okay, their standard deviation is 1.79. Of course, the sample size is the same because we have paired samples, so the number of husbands matches the number of wives. Uh, and we get a standard error of 0 0.09 for husbands. Or I could ask you to calculate the standard error of the mean difference score down at the bottom here. Uh, and there's a couple ways I might ask. One, I might just ask you what it is. So for example, if I have this question over to the right here, if this study were repeated over and over again, how much would you typically expect the size of the group mean difference score to deviate from the true difference score in the population? So that's the exact same question as a standard error of the mean, but rather than asking about how far mean deviates from the population parameter, I'm saying how much the mean difference score deviates from the population parameter. So I've just saying the exact same thing, I'm just adding the word different score. How much does the mean different score deviate from the population parameter? And again, it's the exact same formula. The only thing is that I'm just going to clarify it rather than just say standard deviation. I'm going to clarify standard deviation of different scores divided by the square root of n. And that will give us our standard error of different score. So we get our standard deviation right here. Again, our standard deviation was 2.19. So plug that in there, our sample size is 394, we see it right there. Plug that in, 2.19 divided by the square root of three point, divided by the square root of 394, gives us 0.11, which is indeed what we have down here for a standard error of the mean difference score. Or I might ask you to calculate a t-test. And a t-test is always going to be a statistic divided by its standard error. So in this case, our statistic is the difference between wives and husbands. Our difference is negative 0.96. So that's our, 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 our statistic, the difference between wives and husbands, divided by the standard error, standard error of that difference score, standard error of the mean difference score is 0.11. So negative 0.96 divided by 0.11, I get negative 8.73 which is what we have down here for our t, negative 8.73. Or, finally, I might ask you to give me an effect size. In this case, the main default effect size to report would be a d statistic. So I might ask you to calculate the d statistic. And a d statistic, you take the, the difference between wives and husbands divided by the pooled standard deviation. And so we need to get that standard deviation. What is the pooled or average standard deviation for wives and husbands? And given that we have a paired samples data set, we don't have to worry about issues of one group being larger than another because everything's pairs, and so the number of wives is equal to the number of husbands. Um, so I can simplify my formula here. I'm just going to take the standard deviation for wives and square it to get the wives' variance and add it to the, to the husbands' variance and divide by two so I'm going to square things to turn my standard deviations to variances, take the average variance, 
and then take the square root of that to turn it back into a standard deviation. So y of standard deviation, 1.62, plug that in here, and square it to get the wives' variance. Husband's standard deviation, 1.79, plug that in right there, square it to get the husband's variance. Add wives' variance plus husband's variance to get the total variance of the two, divided by two to get my average variance, take the square root, and I turn it back into a standard deviation, and my pooled standard deviation with a little bit of rounding is 1.707. So hang on to that pool standard deviation, and now we can plug it in. Here's our pool standard deviation, 1.707. I'm going to plug it in right here into my D statistic formula, where I get my difference between wives and husbands, negative 0.96 divided by the pool standard deviation, and I get a d-statistic of 0.56, which when we were just trying to eyeball things and give a general estimate, we, we were, it would look like it was something just a little bit larger than half a standard deviation, a difference uh, between wives and husbands, and indeed, that's what we see here, a d-statistic just slightly larger than 0.5, um, which would be a, uh, a medium-sized effect if we're giving it a small, medium, and large, we could say we've got a medium effect here. Now, recall that we had this completely different question right here in the middle. So I might ask something like this. What is the numerical value that indicates the degree of association between wives and husbands? And again, that's that paired sample correlation question. That's the thing. We can't ask that question if I have two independent groups because we only have one score for people. Everyone in group one has one score on something. Everybody in group two has one score on something. So everybody has just that one score in the outcome variable. We can't say, are those two... Uh, we can't look at a, a paired correlation, but if I have people where everyone has two scores on something, I can say, well, are those two scores correlated? And that's what this paired sample correlation does here. So the answer, what is the numerical value that indicates the degree of association between wives and husbands? 0.18. That's our paired sample correlation right there answers that question. Or I could say the degree of association between uh, wives and husbands is best described as... Uh, and that's where we might choose from, maybe it's described as non-significant or trivial, small, medium, and large. Well, it is significant. Uh, right here, our p-value is something less than 0.05. So, uh, so it's, we want to give an effect size. Is it trivial, small, medium, or large? And a correlation of 0.18, we would call that a small correlation. And finally, how would you give a written summary of a paired samples t-test? Now, to do the written summary of a paired samples t-test is going to be very, very similar to how you do a written summary of two independent samples. Um, now, one thing that I would like you to be careful about is that when you're doing a paired samples t-test, I would like you to be careful not to use the word groups. Um, now, on one hand, it makes sense in terms of how you might normally use language to say, well, if we have the sample, we've got husbands and wives, you could say, well, the group of wives and the group of husbands, and it might make sense uh, to talk about them in that way. But I, I want you to be clear when you're giving me a written summary that you understand that conceptually we're not thinking about this as two separate groups. We're thinking about this as one group one group of couples, every couple has two partners, and we're calculating for every couple what is the difference score. So every couple has a different score, and we're seeing if the, what, what the size of that different score is, and if that different score differs from zero. Um, so I want you not to use language that says two groups, or to imply that you're talking about groups here, because conceptually we're really dealing with just one group, one group of couples. Uh, so keep that in mind. Don't, don't say groups, because if you say groups or talk about two groups, I would probably take off a point or something if you give me a written summary that uses that language. But otherwise, everything's pretty much the same here. So I'm going to say there was a significant difference between, and again, those words difference between are key there. I can't think of how you would describe what we're talking about when we're comparing a difference between, in this case, wives and husbands. Um, how you could talk about a difference between them with using any other words than difference between. So it's, your sentence needs to include, include those words, difference between. Uh, it was a significant difference, so clarify that that was significant. So we have a significant difference between, and a difference between what and what. We have a difference between wives and husbands. So that's basically the same format we had when we were looking at two independent samples. There was a significant difference between, a difference between what and what, between wives and husbands.
and then we give those five pieces of information. That is, we give the name of the descriptive statistic given an effect size, give the value of our effect size, we give the name of our inferential statistic, the value of the inferential statistic, and then a p-value. So we want to do all that stuff in our parentheses here. And so I've got our descriptive statistic giving an effect size is the D statistic. So give D equals and give the value. We calculated that our D was 0.56. Uh, and again, that's one of those things uh, that if you take away the negative sign uh, in our example back here, actually, um, it should have been. In fact, I even took away the negative sign in the example here because if we kept it right there, it actually should have been negative 0.56 if we kept it there. So technically, that should have been negative 0.56. Um, but it's one of those things that uh, uh, it means the same thing either way. It's arbitrary, but which group is first or second. So if you happen to do that same thing, if you write a D statistic on a test and you take away the negative sign, that's perfectly fine. Um, uh, although, be careful on Canvas, because when you're entering stuff for homeworks on Canvas, Canvas doesn't know any better and doesn't know that the negative sign is purely arbitrary. So do keep negative signs when you're entering stuff on Canvas. But when you're giving written summaries, uh, it's fine. If you want to keep the negative sign, you can do that. If you want to leave it off like I've done here, uh, uh, you can do it that way as well. So D equals 0.56. Then our T value is 300, with 393 degrees of freedom, the same thing as before. We put our degrees of freedom in parentheses. And then our T value is 8.73. And then our P value and remember, never write P is equal to zero uh, in doing written uh, summaries. Again, on Canvas, when you're entering homework uh, answers, if I say, give me the P value exactly as it appears on the page, and if it says 0 .000 on a page, then that's what I want you to enter. But when you're doing a written summary, uh, I want you never to write P is equal to zero. So if the P says 0 .000 on the output, we're going to round it and say, well, it's something less than 0 .001. So say P is less than 0 .001. And then, just as with the two independent samples, uh, I want you to tell me who was higher and who was lower. So we've said there's a difference between, uh, between wives and husbands, but we haven't said uh, who, what's, uh, uh, are wives higher or are husbands higher. And we haven't yet told the reader higher or lower in what? What is the outcome variable? What is the variable we're looking at here? Uh, in this case, we're looking at withdrawal scores. And so I can say it like this. I can say the wives received lower withdrawal scores than the husbands. Or if you preferred, you could have said the husbands received higher withdrawal scores than the wives. So that clarifies who was higher, who was lower, and higher or lower in what? In this case, in withdrawal scores. And then embedded in that phrase, uh, I've also put the means and the standard deviations for wives and husbands. Uh, so the mean for the wives was 3.57, their standard deviation 1.62. Mean for husbands 4.53, standard deviation 1.79. And as I mentioned in the, uh, with the previous example, do be careful to make sure you give me those means and standard deviations after you've told, told the reader uh, what it is we're talking about. Uh, so make sure the reader knows, and for example, if you're going to give me the mean standard deviation for wives withdrawal scores, make sure the reader knows we're talking about wives withdrawal scores before you give me the mean standard deviation. So don't put, don't say it with wives and say right here, don't, don't, by that little arrow is, don't say it with the wives, mean equals 3.57 standard deviation 1.62, close parentheses, receiving lower withdrawal scores. Don't put it right there because if you put it right at that dot there, uh, at that point in the sentence, you have not yet told the reader you're talking about withdrawal scores, and so the reader won't know what that mean refers to until after the reader finishes reading the sentence, and that makes it very awkward for reading. So make sure you give the means and the standard deviations at an appropriate point in the sentence where the reader understands what you're talking about. And then finally, I have one final sentence giving the effect size. In this case, this represents a medium effect. Uh, and so give the final sentence there summarizing the effect size. Now, of course, if this was non-significant, I would not say anything about the effect size. I wouldn't say medium effect. I just wouldn't talk about the effect size. And I would say there was not a significant difference between groups. And I would say with wives receiving similar withdrawal scores uh, as husbands rather than calling one group lower or higher.
uh, although as I've mentioned before, if this were a test, it would be very unusual for me to give you an example that was non-significant because when you're given written summaries, usually I like to uh, get examples where you're showing me you can write up results when they're significant. And that is everything uh, all for all of our examples for Unit 3.